All right. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Amelia Smith Reinhart, and I am the William J. Mayer Jr. Dean here at the College of Law. And it is my great pleasure to welcome you to today's Constitutional Day lecture. This day marks the anniversary of the signing of the Constitution by its drafters on September 17, 1787. It became an official holiday in 2004, thanks in part to the great icon of West Virginia, the late Senator Robert C. Byrd. Ringing in the first constitutional day on the Senate floor, Senator Byrd shared his personal devotion to the Constitution, which I understand he always kept a copy of in his jacket, like many of you law students, I'm sure, do, and stressed the importance of educating Americans about this founding document. Um, to quote him, it depends on the personal commitment of each and every one of us to learn, to understand, and to preserve the governing principles that are set forth so clearly and powerfully. This year's program will be a lecture from Professor Richard Katsky from Duke University School of Law, and he will address the Supreme Court's recent jurisprudence regarding civil liberties. Our very own Associate Dean Blake will introduce our speaker now. So thank you to Dean Blake and Professor Katsky for joining us today. This individual has a long and storied career, so I'll keep it brief. Um, so he's currently the director of the Appellate Litigation Clinic and an assistant clinical professor at Duke University Law School, which he just began that position this summer. Um, before arriving at Duke, Katsky was the vice president and legal director of Americans United for Separation of Church and State, where he challenged and defended governmental action in fields of healthcare, education, employment, public accommodations, and immigration, principally under First Amendment's establishment, free exercise, and free speech clauses. Katsky was also a member of the Supreme Court and appellate practice at Mayor Brown in Washington, D.C., and served as Dep Deputy Director of the Program Legal Group in the U.S. Department of Education's Office for Civil Rights. He has taught First Amendment law at American University's College of Law and professional and political ethics at Harvard's JFK School of Government and Harvard College. Katsky received his JD from Yale Law School, where he was an articles editor and can commiserate with you on that exper uh, experience. His AM in political science from Harvard University and his AB with highest distinction and high honors in political science from the University of Michigan. He clerked for two uh, federal judges, Judge Guido Calabresi of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit and for Judge Stephen Reinhardt of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. And with that, I will leave you in Professor Katsky's very capable hands. Oh, thank you. That's really kind of you. Um, look, uh, today we come together to celebrate our Constitution and its blueprint for government and society. So I wanted this talk to be celebratory. Spoiler alert, not so much. Um, we, we've all been taught that the Supreme Court's legitimacy comes from the structural limitations on judicial power. Don't worry that nine unelected judges can decide the biggest, most contentious political and social and economic issues because those constraints make sure that the judges aren't just roving policymakers with life tenure. Let me list four of the limitations. First, courts decide only the cases before them. Article III's case or controversy requirement means that the courts are disciplined by the facts. They aren't usurping the power of Congress, the power of the people, because all they do is resolve concrete disputes between ordinary folks. Um, courts are legitimate arbiters because we don't, they keep it so that we don't have to resort to self-help remedies. What a great lawyerly circumlocution that is, right? Self-help remedies. So in, in, in my sort of previous life before being a lawyer, I was, I was uh, studying to be a um, political theorist. Then I decided I wanted to eat, another story. But, um, but, but, Political theorists have a sort of a simpler way of saying what lawyers call self-help remedies. They say, we let the courts resolve disagreements so we don't end up killing each other over every stupid little thing. 
elected legislatures, they deal with the big, broad, abstract issues. And if we're unhappy with the way they do it, we can kick the bums out. That's where their legitimacy comes from. But courts are like the janitors. They clean up the leftover messes, make it so that, I don't know, I don't have to hit my neighbor over the head with a rock or run her over with the car when she lets her dog poop on my lawn. And she doesn't have to preemptively kill me to protect herself. Second principle, very decisive. Settled legal rules normally stand, even if the court would decide them differently today if it was writing on a blank slate. Stable rules have let me protect, sorry, I'm doing something weird here. Sta stable legal rules help me protect your actions, uh, I'm sorry, predict your actions, and give me recourse when you cheat. So again, we don't end up killing each other. And if courts make a bad rule, well, the legislatures can come in and clean that up, which gets to the third principle. When the courts depart from stare decisis, especially when it comes to constitutional interpretation, that's normally to recognize a new fundamental right for the unrepresented or the underrepresented. Why? Well, for majority rule to work, the majority can't kill or uh, enslave or suppress or silence the minority. Um, we have to be able to have the ideas is shifting majorities, not a fixed and permanent one. So we're all willing to play the game of leaving decisions up to, um, up to uh, democratic politics, decision by majority rule, um, because I might lose today, but I could win again t tomorrow. We don't ever need to turn to armed re rebellion. We have a mechanism for dealing with the strife. OK, great. Um, fourth principle, and this one's a little more complicated. No constitutional right gets priority over any other. Uh, if, we have, if we have what looks like a conflict between two of them, we have to interpret them and resolve the tension in a way that respects both of them. Which is more important, uh, free speech or equality, equality or religious freedom? These can be really interesting theoretical questions, but they're not ones that our legal system either asks or answers. Why not? Well, once again, you know, you can sing the theme along with me. It's to go back to make sure that the, 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 there aren't permanently empowered folks uh, who uh, oppress everyone else, so nobody resorts to violence in the street. Okay, to review, courts get their legitimacy because they make majority rule work over time. And, but that happens only if, number one, they're limited to the facts of the case before them. Number two, after they've made a legal rule, it's sticky. Uh, we can rely on it and plan our actions accordingly. Uh, three, when the ground rules do change, it's to expand the structural protections for the disempowered not to enhance the power of the already empowered majority. And four, no fundamental right, and hence no class of people, get systematically preferred over any other. Case after case, year after year, decade after decade, the Supreme Court has told us that those are the rules, except not in this case. Now the Supreme Court has, to just give a few things, erased a constitutional right to abortion, keeps re reinterpreting the Second Amendment to produce, we don't really know what, uh, gutted the First Amendment's Establishment Clause, and is moving that way on equal protection, I think, uh, to elevate religious exercise over all other fundamental rights, and interprets free speech and free exercise to prefer religiously-based discrimination by the majority faith over religious minorities and kind of everybody else. Now, whether you like or dislike the bottom line results in any of those cases, as law students and lawyers and law professors and maybe some future judges, what, court, what the court is doing could actually trouble us all regardless of politics or religion or policy or any of those things. I argued one of the recent cases in the Supreme Court on religion, Kennedy against Bremerton School District, which is the one about the, the, the football prayer, the coach praying on the field at the public school in Washington. I want to use that case and just a few other things to try to illuminate how I think the court has thrown out the rules of the game 
And then I want to say a word about why I think that threatens the court's legitimacy. And that, in turn, kind of rips at the threads that, terror, that hold law and society together. But let me start really concretely and give you some facts in the process. Because principle number one, courts are limited to the facts of the case before them. Decisions might well have broader implications, but courts aren't legislatures. They're, again, they're janitors. Um, the court decided in Kennedy whether the fact that Joe Kennedy, this coach, was on salary as a part-time football coach at a public high school meant that the Bremerton School District could fire him for saying prayers that were, in his lawyer's words, personal, private, solitary, and silent. This is a perfect little question for courts, except here's what actually happened. For seven years, Joe Kennedy prayed with the team in the locker room before and after the games. Um, and then at the end of the games, right after that handshake line that the two teams do together, he, he would go over and deliver a prayer on the 50-yard line right in the middle of the field. He says that at first, when he started coaching, he just did that on his own. And then within a game or two, students started joining him. And by the end of the first season, we had this. Um, he was standing in the middle of the field. That's him holding the helmets from both teams. And he'd hold them up, and he'd deliver what he called a, um, a motivational prayer. That was his, his term. And, and that went on for the rest of the seven years he was coaching. Um, and then in the eighth year, in September, um, uh, the coach of an opposing came, team came up to the Bremerton principal um, at one of the games. And he said, hey, you know, last year when we played you, Coach Kennedy invited us, my whole team, to join your team prayer. And that was so cool that you allow that. Because... If you're a public school teacher or coach, you don't do just whatever you want with the students. The administration and the school board have to bless it. They have to allow it for you, for you to do it. So this, the principal and then the superintendent realized, we have a little bit of a problem here. A teacher or a coach delivering prayers to students at a, at a public school event, kind of a no-no. So the superintendent wrote Kennedy a letter saying, the students can pray alone or together, and of course, you can pray too, but you, but you can't hold team prayers. Here, now, here are some ways that we can arrange so that you can, have, you can have personal prayers before the game and after the game, and you know, but, but really, come talk to me, the superintendent says. And by the way, it's a really small place that everybody knows everybody else. The superintendent's head of HR um, uh, for the school district was Kennedy's wife. Everybody knows everybody. So he says, come on, talk to me. We'll find something. We'll figure out whatever works for you. Uh, Kennedy doesn't respond, but at the next game, he, um, he, when he does the speech, he, it's, it's, a, it's a secular motivational speech. He leaves out the prayer, and then when the students have left, he goes back onto the field and, has a, and, and prays. Then the next eight games after that, he knelt on the field while everybody was there, but he did it while the students were kind of busy with other stuff, right? Singing the fight song or whatever. And great, problem solved. And by the way, during those games, um, when he wasn't, uh, when he wasn't uh, putting together his, a prayer circle, the students weren't visibly praying on the, on the field either. That didn't happen. Um, okay, uh, but then uh, lawyers from a faith-based law firm in Texas uh, sent the superintendent a letter saying that uh, Kennedy, and I want to quote this, Kennedy has a constitutional right to continue his practice of having verbal, audible prayers on the 50-yard line right after the handshakes with students. Then Kennedy and his lawyers had a big press conference outside at, the, at the school two days before homecoming. Kennedy announced that he was going to keep doing the midfield prayers and no one was going to stop him because, another quote, that's how he makes these kids better people. That's what he said. Okay, so Kennedy also talked on the phone during those couple of days about a dozen times with Bremerton State Representative, Representative of the State House, a guy named Jesse Young. And Young assured Kennedy that he'd be there, he'd be out there right with Kennedy to support him. Meanwhile, the superintendent's office gets 
thousands of calls from across the country crashes their switchboard with a lot of angry people threatening violence if, uh, if they didn't let Kennedy pray. Homecoming came, game comes, the game ends, they have the handshake line, Kennedy goes over, and this time he kneels on the 50-yard line, and hundreds of people jumped the fence, stormed the field, and came over to join him. TV cameras and cables everywhere, and some of the cheerleaders and some of the students in the, in the marching band, they were knocked over by the crowd. Um, so this is what this looks like. The red arrow there, you can just sort of ba basically make out, that's Kennedy in the blue jacket. Um, and next to him, where the, yellow, where the yellow arrow is, that's Jesse Young, that state representative who said, I'll be right there with you. He's got his hand on, on Kennedy's back. Um, the district got a bunch of complaints from the parents of the students who were knocked down. Kind of not a surprise. So the district puts up signs all around the field uh, and makes robocalls to the entire community, not just the school, but everybody in town, saying, no public access to the field at games. Um, they hired some off-duty police, to, a bunch of them actually, to keep, uh, to keep people off the field and make sure that everybody was safe. And the superintendent sent Kennedy another letter saying basically, what happened at homecoming was dangerous, but we can't do that. But here's, here are some more ideas about how we can arrange to have your, you know, for you to have personal prayers when you want them. Uh, but really, come talk to me. Let's work it out. Let's figure out what works for you and also keeps, the, keeps everybody safe and respects the religious freedom of the students and their families as well. Again, no answer. Next game was an away game. Kennedy went onto the field to pray and actually nobody joined him. But the game after that, which was a home game, um, uh, Kennedy goes out there to have the prayer and Representative Young and some other adults and a bunch of a uh, bunch of younger children join him on the field. They all kneel together and, uh, for a prayer, and then Kennedy has uh, has Jesse Young address the team. You know, has them surround and 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 listen. So at that point, the superintendent puts Kennedy on paid leave again, saying, "Look, we really want to accommodate your 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 prayer and your right to pray. Just please talk with me so that we can do that." Um, Again, no response until Kennedy's lawyers file suit, demanding again that he be allowed to continue his prayer practice. Um, let's see if I've got. Oh, wait, that was it. Uh, so, so the, these were what we had, right? So th they have to continue. Oh, and by the way, again, while Kennedy wasn't delivering prayers on the field, including all the time after when he was on leave, he was still having prayers in the stand, and some some uh, some of his pals joined him. But the students weren't doing that, um, and some and some uh, some students on the team and some parents particularly went, and they went to the superintendent and the principal and said, "Thank you so much for doing something about this situation because um, my son is on the team and feels like he felt like he had to go along to get along. He had to he had to pray uh, with with the coach in order to get playing time." Now. Kennedy's prayers were Christian, and some of the students who didn't want to participate were non-Christian. Not, not my kind of prayer. Others, though, were Christian, um, but their families and churches practiced what J Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount about not making a show of your prayer. That's personal between me and, uh, me and God, and that, and that it's distorting it by, by making it this public spectacle. Now, th those are the facts. I gave you a lot, um, but, it's, but even that's only half the story. Um, I'll get back to the big theme in a moment. Um, so there were two rounds of litigation in the case. One was on Kennedy's, re Kennedy's request for a preliminary injunction to be able to, to, to be rehired as a coach and have the prayers while the case was pending. And then there was the merits litigation, which is about for, for, you know, forever after. In the preliminary injunction litigation, the trial court ruled that Kennedy was acting as a coach, a public school official, when he delivered those prayers, and that, viol that would violate the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment, which protects religious freedom for all by barring government-sponsored religion. So no preliminary injunction. On appeal, Kennedy's lawyers insisted that the case was really about personal, private, solitary, silent prayer, but the Ninth Circuit basically said, really? And it affirmed the denial of the preliminary injunction. 
So, uh, now the judge who wrote the opinion, by the way, he wasn't a raging liberal, he wasn't a hater of religion, he's a conservative judge who was appointed by George W. Bush and who is deeply, deeply religious and deeply protective of religious freedom, but religious freedom for everybody, the coach and the students and their families. So, so fine, the Supreme Court denied cert, but Justice Alito wrote a statement, it was for himself and Justices Thomas Gorsuch and Kavanaugh uh, about the denial of, of cert, saying maybe Kennedy was, and this I'll quote Justice Alito, not really on duty at the time in question, in which case not allowing uh, him to say a prayer could be a free speech violation. Or maybe Kennedy was on duty only in the sense that his workday had not ended and that his prayer took place at a time when it would have been permissible for him to engage briefly in other private conduct, say, calling home or making a reservation for dinner at a local restaurant. In which case, this smells like discrimination against religion. Plus, Justice Alito said, it seems like time for us to go back and reconsider both the legal test for free exercise claims and the legal test for religious accommodation claims under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, which is the Federal Employment Discrimination Statute, even though this case doesn't present those questions. Hint, hint. Okay, so Justice Alito's opinion then became the blueprint for what went on back in the trial court um, on the merits. Kennedy's lawyers argued and argued and argued that he wasn't on duty, wasn't acting as a coach, um, and all sorts of non-religious personal conduct was permitted um, at that same moment in the games. But, inconveniently, Kennedy him himself testified that actually, yeah, I was on duty, I was actively supervising the students at that time when I did the prayers, and Kennedy and the other coaches who also testified um, said that, nope, nobody called to make dinner reservations, during the post-game ritual on the field. They didn't check the scores of the, of the games on their phones or read emails or chat with their spouses because they were, you know, coaching. So, uh, so oh, oh, by the way, and one other thing, the head coach, who had been the head coach for 11 years, um, he testified explaining that he had, he had quit uh, the job as head coach at the end of the year. Um, and it just killed him to have to do it. But um, Kennedy supporters, people coming in from out of town to crowd the games to support Kennedy, were coming up to him and threatening him at the game. In uh, at the games, in fact, he said he he and uh, one of the off-duty police who were there were talking about they were worried that they might get shot from the stands um, uh, by by some of the, some of these folks. So this court rules against Kennedy again. The night. Ninth Circuit affirmed again. Same conservative religious judge wrote the opinion. His name is Mylon Smith, Jr. And then, responding to an opinion on denial of rehearing on Bonk that parroted Kennedy's lawyers about what they were supposedly seeking, Judge, judge Smith wrote that the, that the dissenter appears to have succumbed to the siren song of a deceitful narrative of this case, spun by counsel for appellant, to the effect that Joseph Kennedy, a Bremerton High School football coach, was disciplined for holding silent private prayers. That narrative is false. And he closed with, I hope as this case proceeds that the truth of what actually happened will prevail. Sadly, not. The Supreme Court ran in search and they decided that Kennedy's free speech and free exercise rights had been violated when he was prevented from praying privately and alone. Oh, by the way, we discovered after we'd filed our merits brief in the case that Kennedy and his, and his wife had sold their home and moved to uh, Pensacola, Florida two years before, bought a house, um, registered to vote, and they, paced, uh, they were posting a bunch of things on the Facebook page, pictures and things saying that they're all... They're now happy Floridians. So we filed what's called a suggestion of mootness in the court, saying basically the only thing Kennedy is seeking here is an injunction to, to force the school district to rehire him and put him back on the field. 
uh, as, uh, and, and to be able to have the prayers. But coaching is a year-round job. There's intensive training in August. There's the season where it's six days a week between the games and the practices. Um, they're supervising weight training all winter long for the, for the team, spring training for next year's team, football camp all summer long, and then we're back to August again all for a $5,300 a year stipend. So we said, it seems like living in Florida, it's not a commuter job. Um, he might really not want to be able, not want or be able to take, care, uh, take advantage of the injunction. He lives in Florida. Kennedy's lawyers responded that if the court ruled in his favor, he'd be on a plane within, to Washington within hours, the same day, and he'd be back on the field that day. And how dare we say that the case is moot? Now, the justices didn't care about the issue. They didn't ask any questions about it. It, never, it, it, was never, uh, it. it was never of interest to them, and fine. Yet, after Kennedy's, after the court ruled in favor of Kennedy in June 2022, the school district sent Kennedy the HR, the, you know, the paperwork uh, to, to be rehired as a coach. Um, and they designated, here's the special uh, HR person who will walk you through everything so we can have you back on the field for for uh, for August for the you know the intensive training uh, preseason training, no response from Kennedy except for a whole bunch of press conferences complaining that the school district was was stalling. So the school district actually went to the went to the district court to try to move things along, and th by then it was September. The first game had been played, and so Kennedy's lawyers then announced that because the season had already started by then. Kennedy believed that what would be best for the students would be for him to wait until the following March to come back for, football, for uh, spring football with next year's team. Okay. So the school district um, drafted and agreed to and signed a consent decree. Uh, the, the court ruled everything is set for him to come back in March, but March comes and goes, no Kennedy. Uh, summer, summer football comes and goes, no Kennedy. Uh, the August training comes and goes, same thing. Now it's September, this September now, uh, the new season, just a couple of weeks ago. Kennedy showed up for exactly one game, and then he submitted his resignation to go back to Florida where he and his wife live. So much for deciding live controversies, right? Okay. Nor did the facts of, on justi uh, or justiciability concerns, that's not an easy word to say, justiciability concerns matter to the court in 303 Creative. That was the case last term about the website designer who said that she wanted to do wedding websites but didn't want to serve same-sex couples and she worried that she might get in trouble with the Colorado Civil Rights Commission. Now, she'd never done wedding websites before, hadn't had a same-sex couple come try to hire her, and the Colorado Civil Rights Commission had never heard of her until she filed suit. When pressed in the lower courts, though her lawyer said that there was the, her lawyer said that there was this one gay couple, Stuart and Mike, who kind of sort of talked to her about maybe being interested in having her uh, do a website, and they listed Stuart and Mike's con uh, contact information in the court filing. Later, while the court was in the the case was in the Supreme Court, a reporter from the New Republic called up Stuart and Mike at the number that was in the in the filings there. And Stuart answered, sorry, what? No, we never talked to a website designer, never heard of her. Um, we've been married for years, we have kids, why would we need a wedding website? Oh, and by the way, um, we're not a same-sex couple, Mike is my wife. In fact, the whole thing was, right, was, it was made up, and it turns out that the whole, it looks like now the whole business was made up. Look on the website for 30, on the web for 303 Creative. Um, it, 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 it doesn't exist and probably never did. But the Supreme Court's fake, uh, uh, held that a fake business's First Amendment rights were violated by Colorado's anti-discrimination laws. Now, look, some of you will like that result and some of you will dislike it. That's, that's fine. But regardless, and what I really want to get to after all of that, is what does it mean that the court will accept falsehoods or rewrite reality, never mind pesky Article 3, um, whatever it takes to get to an issue that it wants to decide? I think that's dangerous, and, and none of us should be terribly happy about it. 
Principle number two, stare decisis. The court used Kennedy to throw, out the governing, to throw out the governing legal test for the Establishment Clause, the Lemon Test, it's called, after a case called Lemon against Churchill. It asks, is the primary purpose of government action religious or secular? Is the, is the primary effect of an action the government takes religious or secular? And is there some way that governmental and religious authority are getting kind of twisted up together? Um, the court said that hasn't really been the test practically since the day Lemon was decided in 1971. So it was unreasonable and unconstitutional for the school district to stop Kennedy from having the, from having the prayers, those prayers, um, for fear that it would violate the Establishment Clause. Never mind that the court used that very test in 2000 to hold that organized prayer at public school football games is unconstitutional. The court now tells us to determine whether the Establishment Clause is being violated look to history and tradition. It is, this isn't originalism. It's not, what did the framers think about prayer at public, uh, uh, at football games at public high schools uh, at the time of the founding? After all, 1791, when the First Amendment was uh, ratified, football didn't exist. Uh, it, wasn't, it was played first by accident in 1869, and the first rules of the game were in 1880. Public schools didn't exist either. Not until the 1820s to begin with. Okay, fine. But what about prayer at government events generally? That could, be the, that could be history and tradition. Well, the Bill of Rights didn't apply to the states until the 14th Amendment was passed in, the 18, in 1868. And the religion clauses weren't recognized to apply to the states until, uh, until incorporation in the 1940s. The, um, and the federal government at the founding was this tiny little thing that really wasn't holding any events with prayer or without prayer. Look to history and tradition is not really a legal test. It's kind of a, kind of a slogan and one that really no one knows quite what means. It's also, by the way, the new Second Amendment doctrine as of New York State Rifle and uh, Pistol Association against Bruin, a, a case from last year, 2022. The Second Amendment isn't my area, but I have some colleagues who are experts in it, and they tell me that they have yet to find any originalists who think that Bruin can be defended as uh, originalism. And they also tell me that because history and tradition is so, is this phrase, is so empty, the lower courts are just floundering. They don't know what the heck to do with this. I fully expect to see a, singular, a similar move for equal protection, by the way. But where we don't look to history and tradition, where the matter of originalism doesn't fly, that's the free exercise clause. The very same scholars, it turns out, um, religion law scholars, who have gone through and, uh, and written a history of the Establishment Clause that says it really didn't mean very much at the time of the founding. The people who the Supreme Court uh, cite for that, like Michael McConnell, the former Tenth Circuit judge who runs the Constitutional Law Center out at Stanford, those folks have written at length that the Free Exercise Clause was never understood to mean that it, you, uh, you're entitled to be exempt from or not obey a law uh, because you have a religious, uh, religious objection to it. In fact, they explain the first Congress, of, a few weeks after passing the First Amendment, um, they, they had a really serious, hard-fought debate about whether, um, whether uh, there would be religious exemptions from the draft. And it was clear in all these debates, nobody thought for a second that the Free Exercise Clause did that. This was a policy question that would have to be decided by statute, and they fought about it. They ended up deciding that, yes, they, they granted a a limited uh, religious exemption from the draft, and that's been the law ever since. Um, but, but okay, uh, yet another peculiarity about replacing Establishment Clause jurisprudence with this phrase, history and tradition. So the usual complaint about the Lemon Test was confusing, hard to apply, a mess, no, it doesn't give clear guidance, nobody knows what the heck it means. The real problem wasn't that. It was people not liking the results. I litigated cases for about 20 years using the Lemon Test in front of uh, judges from all across the jurisprudential spectrum and all across the 
the political spectrum and all across the religious spectrum, you name it. And I have yet to see any who were actually confused by the, by the established, the, 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 the recognized lemon test. Now, here are a couple of quick examples. A couple of years before Kennedy, the Kennedy decision, a district court had to decide whether a 34-foot tall Latin cross in a, in a park in a, in a city in Pensacola violated the Establishment Clause. This wasn't my case, by the way. The judge wrote a 29-page opinion saying that it does. Okay, fine. The first page and a half were all the facts and all the legal analysis under the, under the Lemon Test. It was, it was clear, obvious, certain. The result was, town can't do this. Then he spent the next 20, the judge spent the next 27 and a half pages saying, but, but how sad that that's the case that the Supreme Court messed up the Establishment Clause law 70 years ago and we've had to live with it, because how could anybody think that this should be unconstitutional? Or I had a case some years ago now where I represented a bunch of parents, uh, Protestant and Catholics and a, a Buddhist also, who challenged the public school's inclusion of uh, te teaching of creationism in biology class. The parents believed that their kids should learn science and science class and leave religion to us, the families, and uh, their houses of worship. Uh, the judge, before he was put on a bench, was chief of staff to a, uh, to a conservative Republican member of Congress who then became, became a state governor. The judge himself had run for Congress on a strict conservative platform. He was appointed to the bench by George W. Bush, and he's a deeply committed Christian and leader in his church. Um, that, that was the judge. And when, um, when he was drawn as the judge in our case, folks on the other side of the issue were crowing in the press and on the web and you name it. Um, as one of them put it, here's the quote, is, the judge is one of George W.'s good old boys. He'll take care of us. After trial, though, the judge wrote a 139-page opinion explaining why, on the facts, the school district had violated the Establishment Clause. The judge retired from the bench a few years ago to become president of his alma mater. Um, and so when the Kennedy decision came out, he wrote a, like a think piece on it, a commentary. And he explained that having done this case that we did, he'd found the lemon test clear, logical, helpful, and by the way, that it accorded with his own re deep reading of history of the original meaning of the Establishment Clause. And he thought it was a terrible loss that the Supreme Court had abolished this standard because he'd spent more than a year on our case. It was a 40-day trial. Um, it was that 139-page opinion. And he didn't have a clue what you would do with, with look to history and tradition. Okay. Uh, principle number three. When the court departs from stare decisis, especially on constitutional issues, and by the way, I'm close to being done here, especially on constitutional issues. It's supposed to expand the rights of the unrepresented. It doesn't abolish rights. Except Dobbs. Lots of, uh, lots of legal experts say that's the first time that the Supreme Court has, um, has actually erased a fundamental, uh, a fundamental right. The truth, though, is that for the past decade or so in my area, in religion law, um, it's been all about dismantling, dismembering uh, fundamental non-discrimination protections in employment and public accommodations and healthcare and foster care and you name it. Um, that gets to the fourth principle. When two constitutional rights seem to conflict, we interpret them in a way that respects both. Except not when it comes to religion. The two, the two religion clauses are supposed to work hand in hand to protect religious freedom. The free exercise clause protects my right to practice my faith um, as I see fit, according to the dictates of conscience is, is the way that theologians would describe it. And the establishment clause protects me from using the levers of government power to press my religious beliefs or practices on you because that's how we protect your conscience rights also. Yet the Supreme Court treats the, uh, the two religion clauses as opposing forces. Actually, that's not really right. What they do is they treat it as a, 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 cedar, a, a seesaw, a teeter-totter. Um, if you want to elevate one right, you have to depress the other. And because the, a supermajority on the court wants free exercise to be the 
preeminent, or their version of free exercise free, preeminent in any way, they need to depress and diminish and erase the Establishment Clause. That's how the, the, right, the, the teeter totter works. And same thing, by the way, with equal protection and anti-discrimination laws and all that. Those kind of have to be tamped down, too, so that this can be elevated. There's been a pattern, though, over about the past 70 years. A fundamental right gets recognized. Um, and then um, the, some of the folks who, who fought and lost, um, they assert a religious uh, objection. They say that because of my faith, I shouldn't have to follow the law. It teaches something different. Um, in the 1950s and 60s, that was what happened with race. Courts recognized uh, equal protection rights against race discrimination and upheld statutes like Title II of the Civil Rights Act, which is the federal public accommodations law, as valid exercises of Congress's authority to enforce those, to enforce those fundamental rights. In 1968, along comes the owner of, of a barbecue joint in South Carolina, who, by the way, is also head of, I want to get this right, the National Association for the Preservation of White People. He refuses to seat an African-American woman, she, by the way, she's the wife of a minister, saying that his, his religion teaches that blacks and whites aren't equal and can't be treated as they are, so he has to make his, his restaurant whites only, and Title II of the Civil Rights Act cannot be enforced against him because that would violate his religious freedom. The case goes, he lost, he lost by the way, the case goes up to the Supreme Court on an issue of attorney fees, not on the merits, but there's a little footnote, it's about three sentences, in which the court addressed the substance of the guy's underlying claim. It explained, it told what his position was. It didn't criticize his religious belief. Um, it didn't, it, you know, it said not one word against. It simply said that as a legal argument for not having to comply with the law, that sort of a claim was frivolous. Because that's not how law works. And by the way, it's also not how the constitutional right to religious freedom was supposed to work either. Lots of cases like that about race in the 60s and 70s. And then about, same thing for sex in the 1970s and 80s. Rights, uh, women's rights get recognized. And along comes a religious nonprofit um, that says it shouldn't have to comply with the Fair Labor Standards Act because it, because our faith teaches that men are the heads of households, and that means you have to pay men enough to, uh, to support the, the whole household. Women aren't supposed to be the heads of households. Maybe they're not even supposed to work outside the home, so we don't have to pay them, can't pay them as much, and, or, or, or maybe at all, and that's, uh, and that's required by our religion, and therefore you can't enforce the, the, the equal wage uh, provisions of the Fair Labor Standards Act on them. Again, the court, this was in the Supreme Court, the court did not disparage the religious belief. It didn't say you, you, you shouldn't believe that. It, it just said that those beliefs don't trump other people's rights. Now, though, we get to LGBTQ rights. In Obergefell in 2015, the court, court recognized marriage equality, and, and just, Justice Kennedy, writing for the majority, acknowledged that to people with religious objections, he said, it would, de it would demean a timeless institution if the concept and lawful status of marriage were extended to true persons of the same sex. This view has long been held and continues to be held in good faith by reasonable and insincere people here and throughout the world. Yet, yet the court went on to say that those views are not enough to deny the rights of same-sex couples to equal treatment under the law. Fast forward to Masterpiece Cake Shop in 2017, Trump administration solicitor general representing the United States argued that the First Amendment should protect the right of a bakery to, uh, to refuse service to same-sex couples who refuse to bake a cake for their wedding. At the very end of the solicitor general's brief is this funny little two paragraphs. After a whole bunch of legal argument, the, the two paragraphs say, first says basically, don't worry that deciding this case for the baker is going to license race discrimination. Why not? Because race discrimination is bad. It's a familiar and recurring evil, the brief says, that violates deeply and widely accepted views of elementary justice. By contrast, the second paragraph there, quote Justice Kennedy and Obergefell, and then lots of decent and honorable people oppose same-sex marriage. Racists are evil. 
But good folks hate gay people, so it's totally different. Don't worry. Except in a case back in 2012, the Supreme Court held that a religious school had a First Amendment right to fire a teacher because she had a disability and couldn't be held responsible, liable under the Americans with Disabilities Act. Jump ahead to 2019, which is now after Obergefell. The court held that a religious school could fire a teacher because she had breast cancer, never mind the ADA. And another could fire a teacher and hire somebody younger and cheaper, never mind the Age Discrimination and Employment Act. Those are religious freedom of the school. In the wake of those decisions, there, have been, there are a whole string of cases in which religious schools and colleges and universities and hospitals have fired teachers, academic counselors, nurses, even a volleyball coach, um, because they're gay or disabled or, in the case of the volleyball coach, black. In one case I worked on, uh, some students at a, a, a Christian school in Colorado wore KKK robes to school, and they staged mock executions of, the non uh, of their non-white classmates. And they also harassed a teacher uh, a, a white teacher, by the way, who had, while he was on mission, religious mission, in Dominican Republic, he had adopted an orphaned uh, girl who is, who is black. The teacher responded by a teacher. He put together an assembly to talk about racism. But the parents whose kids had worn those KKK robes and did all that stuff, they didn't like that. They threatened that if the school didn't fire the teacher, they would pull their kids out. That would take away our tuition. So the school, not wanting to lose the tuition, fired him. In that case, and now there's an employment discrimination case. We represented that teacher. Um, in that case, and all the cases, the defense to the employment discrimination claims is that we're a religious organization, so the anti-discrimination laws just can't apply to us. And there have been lots of cases um, where private for-profit businesses make those same arguments. I run a gym or a nursing home or a company that makes mining equipment. My religion teaches that I can't work with people of a different faith, so I can't, I can't hire them or I can fire them. Or in one case, I can threaten to kill the janitor because he's a Catholic and not a Protestant. Um, what worries me, and I think should worry all of us, is not just that the Supreme Court is eroding fundamental rights under a rubric of religious freedom that doesn't bear any relation to precedent or original, uh, original intent or anything like that, or that the court is favoring religious claims of the majority, uh, even over religious freedom uh, rights of, of minority faiths. What worries me is this, and I, what I think should worry us is this. When the court ignores facts, ignores stare decisis, ignores Article III's three, Article limitations on judicial power, it's, it abolishes recognized fundamental rights, and meets preeminent one view, narrow view of one right at the expense of everyone and everything else, it really undercuts the legitimacy of the court, which in turn threatens the legitimacy of, of our, our, elect, our elected majority rule institutions because they're what, the courts are what keep that fair and keep that working. And that makes January 6th armed insurrection, killing each other in the streets, seem like an appropriate and maybe even an unnecessary way to defend ourselves against political institutions doing things that we don't like. Today we celebrate the genius of our constitutional order, and it should be celebrated. But I, for one, am also taking a moment to kind of mourn its end. Thank you. Okay, some people have to go to class. I think we probably have some time for questions for people who can remain. Um, and any? I'm really sorry to have gone so long that students have to leave. No, no, we started a little late too. Any, any, any takers? Any questions? Yeah. I had a question um, pertaining to the case that you were working on. Um, did it ever, or was there ever an argument from the other side that kind of pointed to the fact that, like, after, like, sporting events, you know, people tend to, athletes tend to come together and, I won't say 
fellowship, but basically appreciate the fact that no one was hurt and just like, just be happy that like that part of things didn't happen and, and, and nothing bad happened to anybody. I was just wondering, like, because when, when you were speaking about it, I'm thinking about when I was playing sports yep. so long ago. And just, you know, when we would in the game, we would kind of come together and just be happy that we were all good. Yeah, so that didn't come up in the way that you might expect, but for a particular reason. And that's that the school district all along was saying, students coming together to pray, absolutely, uh, they absolutely have that right. That's respected. We, we, we make room for that. We cannot interfere with that, and we don't. And you, Joe Kennedy, also get to pray. The problem is when the school is sponsoring it. And the, problem, and the reason that that's a problem is the, I got to go along to get along. Um, and so, and so the, right, the students coming together, that's, the, the, of course that happens. It, it, interestingly, it didn't happen here when he wasn't leading things. But I suspect that some of the students were doing exactly that on their own someplace. I don't know where. Um, because, yeah, it's really common. The question that we have to ask is um, sort of what's the government's role in that and who's being, who, who, who feels like I don't really have a choice but, but, to, but to do it. I don't know if that's, um, but, 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 you're, but the way that you think about and you experience sports, that's true. That's absolutely true for lots of people. Sorry, I'm grabbing the mic. <laughs> First, thank you for coming. Your speech was incredible. Um, so when I was reading Dobbs, this originalist tradition and history thing really bothered me personally because I thought it was so ambiguous and confusing. So what, as a lawyer and as an advocate, like what can you do to come to the courts to fight against that? Because I feel like it's something that they like to use as a way, just like a foundational, we're going to say whatever we want because it's history and tradition, you can't fight against this. Yeah, so you put your finger on something incredibly difficult. Uh, and, and, and here's what it is. A lot of us um, are trying to figure out when, how do you, there's something called law office history. I don't know if you've ever heard this term, but it's the stuff that you write when you're an advocate for somebody and you and you want to tell the story of if it's whether it's under the label of originalism or history and tradition or or you know the 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 background to a statute or whatever else you, you lawyers go back and they write these very limited selective things um, real historians think it's an embarrassment to the to the discipline um, that that's the way history is done in the courts so one of the things that I'll tell you I've been thinking a lot about is, is whether or how we might get real history by real historians who will deal with the complexities in the world, right? Not try to reduce it to something simple, not try to do something because it's what I want to be said and argued, uh, to have that enter our serious legal dialogue. Will that happen or not? I don't know. In some of the lower courts I expect it to, Frankly, what I've seen from the Supreme Court, I don't think they're terribly interested in it. And the reason I say that is that thing I said about the not using the history of the free exercise clause by the same scholars who give them their history of the establishment clause suggests a kind of a willingness to pick and choose without regard to you know the, the world. But I do also I'm not complete I'm not so pessimistic that I don't think having uh, having real history out there is helpful. That's about the best thing I can come up with, and I know you should be unsatisfied by that because I am too. Thanks. I just wanted to uh, touch, or go back a little bit to what Clarence mentioned, and you talked about this, and it's the coer like the coercive nature of choosing, of joining or not joining in these prayers. Yeah. And I'm going on mem total memory, but. If I recall correctly, Justice Kavanaugh raised that in oral argument. And was that ever then ultimately addressed in the opinions, or how did the court actually handle? To me, there's this coercive nature where if one doesn't participate, one most likely wouldn't would see their playing time affected. And how was that actually addressed in the opinion yeah. after it was raised in oral argument? Right. So that was, in many ways, the most interesting question, or maybe it was two there, from Justice Kavanaugh saying, <laughs> And, and by the way, Justice Kavanaugh, um, his his daughters, I think he has five daughters, all play basketball, and he's coached their team. So he's been a coach for a long time. 
And he asked, a, he asked the question, um, well, how do you really know that there isn't that sort of coercive pressure on the students? Because you did, did, do you start this uh, you know, next week or not? And if you don't, is the reason you didn't start because you didn't have a good practice or were late or, or aren't playing so well? Or is it because you wouldn't join the coach in his prayers? And there's no way for the students on the team to figure that out. And so isn't it going to be the case that you would, you would, you would have to, you know, if you wanted to play, you would hedge your bets. That wasn't the phrase he used, but that was the concept, right? And so, of course, you would go along. That was a question Justice Kavanaugh asked and, um, and asked of the other side and a little bit came back to it with me, which was very much in the theme of what we were arguing. It did not not a word of that in the opinion. Um, a lot of the articles, though, that came out after the argument kept saying the most interesting question and the most interesting moment of the day was Justice Kavanaugh's, which I think is right. It just no, nowhere to be seen um, in the I'm, I'm going to wrap with one more question before people get pizza. Um, so for folks who are interested in these issues, do you have one or two cases that you think are coming up through the courts that you're most concerned about that you think will be kind of the next pinnacle of this issue? Well, to some extent, there are so many things coming up, it's hard to know what to, what to look for. But I will say this. Um, the... the um, we expected 303 Creative, not because we expected it was going to be 303 Creative, but it might, but because it was one of a half dozen cases or more it, with exactly the same structure uh, of argument uh, raising the issue there. And we knew it was going to be one or another of those. And actually, the groups who are pushing that, that litigation, they're kind of in a race with each other, too, because if you get if it's your case you get a lot of attention and a lot of money too um, in contributions um, so what are the areas uh, well your area healthcare is going to be where I one of the things that I'm that I'm watching closely um, and and particularly whether um, whether re, whether a religious exemption um, it gives you the right to whether it's deny a patient information or, um, or to refuse to treat somebody in this particular way. There's a regulation that, that was put in place uh, during the Trump administration that uh, we challenged, and actually there were four suits. We had one of four suits challenging the regulation that says basically this. Um, if a, um, if a, any worker at a healthcare facility that receives federal funds, that's the hook for, for um, con congressional authority, um, if any employee of any sort, it can be a doctor, it can be a nurse, it can be a file clerk, it can be whomever, um, does not want to uh, treat someone or, or help a patient because of a religious objection either to the patient or to the procedures the patient might need, then that person doesn't, uh, doesn't have to do it. And if the hospital says, Gee, let us know if there are people or conditions you won't treat so we can plan and staff for it, that asking that question is religious discrimination against the employee at the expense of um, lo you lose all your federal funds, which means no more accepting Medicare and Medicaid, which means the people who most are in need of, of the health care can't get it. So, so, here's, so here's the here are two examples from that. One of them is from the regulation. A, an ambulance comes up to the scene of an accident, um, and there is uh, and and there's a, a pregnant person who is injured. This might end up being that it could cause a miscarriage that would take a DNC, a, a, a kind of an abortion, um, and so because of the possibility or an ectopic pregnancy is listed in there, there are a couple of things where there's a possibility that the treatment at the hospital might end up being requiring an abortion, that the ambulance driver can just refuse to transport, leave the person there, not call for another ambulance, not do anything else, just, just, just go. Or the, um, or, um, the, um, clerk, you know, the desk clerk in the hospital in the emergency room who takes your insurance card, if that person, if I come in and 
that uh, and that person decides uh, don't want don't want you seen don't want to work with you because you know maybe maybe because of your race, and maybe because you're a same-sex couple, and maybe because of your religion, and maybe because your parents are a same-sex couple or an interracial couple or anything else, that that person can just leave you sitting in the waiting room, again, not tell, not tell anybody, um, get anybody else to come help you, and just, you can, you can bleed out. Uh, and that, and again, that asking that question is, uh, is religious discrimination. I don't know what sort of pattern in healthcare, but I think healthcare is going to be one of the areas where it will surely happen. And there are so many of these things now, so many, beginning to be so many cases. We'll just have to see. And some of them, by the way, get presented as, as in, in, you know, as boring regulatory matters that really get to sort of deeply fundamental uh, issues. And, and some of them are, you know, they arise out of a particular crisis. So, so I, I gave a long non-answer to your question. Um, the answer is there will be many, many more and, and so many that I don't even know what to put my finger on and say this is the one that I'm watching. Let's, let's not applause for that, how sad that is, <laughs> but, but let's applaud um, Professor Katsky and his amazing talk. Oh, thank, thank you. you.